My name is Jacob Yelton, and I'm here representing the Students of American Studies, which, as you could probably assume, the student organization affiliated with the American Studies program here. Uh, when we started the RSO, or revived it rather, last semester, we kind of had one collective goal, and that was to bring an esteemed American Studies scholar by the end of this year. Uh, and so, for that reason, we are very, very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Lipsitz here. Um, he's been a prominent figure for more than two decades now in shaping the field that a lot of us here study and, and other people here have whatever various interests. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Lilia Soto. She's a friend and colleague of Dr. Lipsitz and a beloved member of our faculty. So, thank you. <laughs> I just, have, uh, I just have about a paragraph to, to uh, read. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Jake, uh, for that uh, introduction. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lilia Soto. I'm an assistant professor here in American Studies and Latino Latina Studies. Um, <clears throat> I am here to introduce Dr. George Lipsitz, uh, a leading scholar in social movements, urban culture, inequality, uh, the politics of popular culture, and whiteness studies. Uh, he currently teaches at the University of California, Santa Barbara in the Departments of Black Studies and Sociology and has previously taught at the University of California, Santa Cruz, the University of California, San Diego, um, the University of Minnesota, and the University of Houston at Clear Lake. Uh, Dr. Lipsitz is the author of over half a dozen books, including American Studies in a Moment of Danger, The Possessive Investment in Whiteness, How White People Profit from Identity Politics, Time Passages, uh, <clears throat> and A Life in the Struggle, uh, Ivory Perry and the Culture of Opposition. Uh, he is the author of, a numerous, of numerous articles, most recently an article that he co-authored with uh, Dr. Barbara Tomlinson, who's also here with us today, uh, titled American Studies as Accompaniment. Uh, Dr. Lipsis is the editor of the Critical American Studies series of the University of Minnesota Press and the co-editor of the American Crossroads series of the University of California Press, among many others. Uh, he is a board member of the African American Policy Forum and sits in the board of directors of the National Fair Housing Alliance. He too is a recipient of endless awards, uh, most recently an appointment as a visiting fellow at the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity at Stanford University and the Ujima, Ujima? Ujima? Uh, award for Outstanding Service uh, to the African American Community from the University of California, San Diego. Um, he has supervised and mentored uh, many students at the undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate level, including yours truly, uh, and uh, has made many of us much, much better scholars for it. So thank you so much. Uh, so uh, his talk today is titled uh, Decorating, the, Decorating the Way to Other Worlds, Expressive Culture in a World, in a world of Crisis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Chuck. Okay, well, thanks to uh, Lilia for that uh, lovely introduction. Thanks to Jacob and the students in American Studies for inviting me to be here today. This is the, the third time I've been in Laramie, first time in 25 years, and I'm here because I have so much uh, appreciation and gratitude for the scholarship that's been done here in the American Studies Department and in other departments. I've been reading the work that's come out of the conversations that you've been having and the only way I can pay that back is to come visit you and uh, learn more and give a talk. And so I'm, I'm very happy to be here and uh, look forward to our, our, our conversations today. Uh, this morning we, we met with uh, some of the master's candidates in American Studies and we see that the, the good work is, is continuing. Uh, I also think I wanted to be here because of the founding of the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research. I think it's probably been, never been more important uh, to explain uh, to the world why humanities scholarship is important, and in some ways it's, it's never been more difficult. That we live in a time of extraordinary transformation and change in the academy, uh, a time when the fiscalization and virtualization and vocationalization of, of education has made people look to course topics and fields of study uh, as simply generators of revenue or sites of investment. And yet we know that the knowledge regimes uh, that we inherit from past centuries are tremendously important. In some ways, uh, uh, my, my former colleague Vlad Gacic used to say that uh, he was tempted to sell the humanities as a nanotechnology because it's a 5,000-year-old system for monitoring the human condition. But I, I don't think that'll work. Uh, as, a, as an investment venture, but it's certainly crucial uh, for us to think about 
why it's important to understand uh, literature, language, history, philosophy, uh, visual imagery, music, uh, what role they play in the world that we're living in. And we also, I think, ought to savor how lucky we are to be able to ask and answer that question, to have had the educations we have, to be able to meet in a room like this. We're not the only thinkers in the world. We're not the only serious people in the world. And yet the educational system has created an opportunity uh, for us to come here and learn things systematically. And that, that's an opportunity that a lot of people don't have. I became especially conscious of the privileges of studying and learning and teaching when I was working with a man named Preston Love, who was a musician, uh, an alto sax player, a section player in the Count Basie band for many years. Uh, Preston grew up in the ghetto of North Omaha, Nebraska. He went to Omaha Tech and he lived in a house that was falling down with uh, uh, raised by a single mother and having uh, eight siblings. And in that house, this, and there's, he, he always shows me a picture of it, and it's hard to believe that you know, it, it could have held uh, nine people that could have lasted. And because his last name was Love, he, he said the family, we used to call this the Love Mansion, you know, which, which sounds like the name of a Barry White song or something like that. So they're living in this rundown place, and they're calling it a mansion. They're eager for knowledge, but there's no chance that Preston Love is going to go to college in uh, 1936 in Omaha, Nebraska, being who he is, who his parents were, what the educational system uh, was like. But one day his brother brought home a radio, and on that radio, the first thing they turned on was a broadcast that turned, to be, turned out to be from New York City. It was the Count Basie Band. It's the first music he ever heard on the radio. And he heard one sound in that, in that band. It was the alto sax. He picked it out, and he said it spoke to him. It came to him across the radio as if it were speaking personally to him. It was being played by the great Earl Warren. This is Earl with an E, not the Earl Warren who was later Supreme Court Chief Justice. But Earl Warren, the alto sax player, was fitting in so well that Preston decided to take up the saxophone himself. And he used his earnings and his brother's earnings to get a secondhand saxophone. Ten years to the day after he opened, they turned that radio on, Preston Love took Earl Warren's chair in the Basie Orchestra. Uh, Bay, uh, Warren had a, a, a stomach ailment. They needed a player. Uh, Preston had played throughout Iowa, Nebraska, Wyoming, Utah, New Mexico, and he was the one picked to replace the person whose music had brought him into, uh, in, into the world of jazz in the first place. My contact with Preston was helping him publish an autobiography he wrote, which came out under the title, A Thousand Honey Creeks Later, My Life in Music from, Ma from Basie to Motown. He wound up playing in the traveling bands of the Motown Orchestra. He backed Billie Holiday and Diana Ross. Uh, he played uh, uh, with Lester Young, uh, and he played with Marvin Gaye. I mean, he had this, this kind of amazing life in music. And the way he survived was by learning things, by being aware of how the music industry operated and by presenting himself as a person of learning. And what this meant was that he always dressed sharp. Uh, you, would, you would see Preston and his, his pants had a, a sharp crease in them. His shoes looked new whenever you ran into him. And he worked to make it clear to people, to people hiring his band, uh, to police officers looking at the activities of his band, to highway patrolmen who stopped the band when it was on the road, who wondered what a bus full of black musicians was doing. He made it his business to sound educated. And he made himself educated on his own. When other people in the band were fooling around, he had a book called How to Build Your Vocabulary 1,000 Ways. And he would memorize a word or two every night. And then you had to use that word three times in conversation the next day because he didn't want anybody to underestimate him. He didn't want anybody to take advantage of him. He didn't want anybody to think he wasn't educated. And in the course of this, he developed this great passion for learning. I came across it when I got his manuscript, which was 
in, a, in an interesting shape. Uh, it, it was written in capital letters. Every sentence was a compound sentence with a colon uh, in the middle of it. But it was a wonderful, eloquent, brilliant description of the life of a working musician. But occasionally, the vocabulary that he had developed would enter in. So there's one place in the book where he's having a fight with Dickie Wells. And he says, uh, Dickie Wells turned around to me and said, shut up, Red. And then he wants to explain that Red was his nickname. So he puts in parentheses after he says, Dickie Wells said, shut up, Red. He puts in parentheses, Red was my moniker or cognomen in the Basie aggregation in those halcyon days. <laughs> And I said, I said, Preston, you sure you want to leave this in this way? And he said, is there something incorrect about my usage of the Queen's English? I said, well, no, actually, you know, it's not incorrect. It's just a little formal for a book. He said, formal. I like that. Because formal meant he had to be taken seriously. And then he talked to me about books that he had read. And he'd say, George, you know, I can't believe that they actually pay you to read books, to write things to talk to students, he didn't know what it was like to talk to students, but to talk to students <laughs> about ideas, uh, 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 about all the, any writing you want to talk about, and you can read it, and you get paid for that. He said, wouldn't it be great if I came out to California and I became a student in one of your classes? Now understand, Preston had educated himself. When other people in the band were drinking and smoking marijuana on the band bus, He's there with a flashlight reading a vocabulary book. And he wants to come and be in my classes. And I said, well, you know, Preston, I think if you were in my class, you'd find it a lot like your days in the Basie band. It wouldn't be that much different because you'd be up reading and everybody around you would be drinking and smoking marijuana. It would be almost exactly the same experience. And he said, I can't believe that. I can't believe that because you have time to read and write and study You'd want to make the most of it. And, I, and it helped me think that maybe I'm not making the most of it. Maybe I underestimate what it means to be in buildings like this, to be able to tap into the things that we've learned about, which, after all, the humanities asks, what, what does one person owe to another? What's our relationship to animals, to nature? Uh, what's the, what is the good life made of? How do we do the honest and honorable and ethical thing? These are worthy things to study. And they're things that are in short supply in the world in which we live. And in some ways, that's what makes the humanity seem so powerless and in many ways so irrelevant. We live in a world that's unraveling in many ways. The economy, the educational system, the environment are all in tremendous peril. And these don't seem to be short-term perils, so little uh, downswings that are going to change. These are fundamental reorganizations in human existence that are taking place uh, in our time. Uh, reorganizations of human existence that involve new technologies, uh, the rapid flow of images, ideas, products, and people around the globe, uh, the ways in which international and transnational financial institutions have uh, much more power than governments, and that the ability of democratic governance to uh, regulate uh, or evaluate uh, what constitutes positive economic activity is in many ways uh, a thing of the past. And of course, we live in an age of perpetual warfare, not only the declared wars that our leaders tell us are going to go on throughout our lifetimes, but the brutality and, uh, and violence that people experience every day from hunger, from repression, uh, from ethnic and racial conflicts. Uh, we live in a world that's in a lot of trouble. If the humanities we ever needed, we need them now. Mahalia Jackson used to have a gospel song saying, if we ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need him now. Well, if we ever needed <clears throat> the humanities before, this would be a good time uh, for them. This would be a good time to ask and answer big questions at a time when millions of people are disposable and uh, displaceable, when they're disinherited and dispossessed, when the people in power don't seem to be able to fix the things that they've broken. And instead of solving problems, much of our public discourse is endless rounds of blaming and shaming. My friend Kalama Yassalam, who, who is a poet, writer, teacher in, uh, from the Ninth Ward in New Orleans, uh, says that in our society, 
Uh, people who control almost nothing are blamed for everything. And people who control almost everything are blamed for nothing. And what do we do in the face of that? What do we have to say? What do we do in these difficult times? Now, of course, it's not new that there are difficult times. Any humanities writer, any time in history is sure they're living in the worst possible time and that things are unraveling. Uh, the great freedom fighter, Franny Lou Hammer, used to say there, there are only three weeks of the year when it's hard to be for social justice and decency. Those weeks are this week, last week, and next week. And this is sort of where we stand, you know, that we, we, we stand in this life at midnight in many ways. Things are always difficult. But at difficult moments, moments of unusual crisis, unusual creativity comes about. The jazz musician McCoy Tyner used to say that pressure creates diamonds, and it's sometimes only with the imperative of serious decisions to make uh, that people can, can find the best inside themselves and others and decide that it's a good time to be alive. It's a good time to think and learn and teach and to solve problems with other people. Earlier this month, I gave a talk in an auditorium very much like this, but not as nice. And uh, I, rec I realized that it was to the day, the 46th anniversary of Dr. King's last day on earth, uh, the day when he was in Memphis, Tennessee, and he had come in to Memphis late. He really didn't want to be there. He was planning the Poor People's March, but he couldn't turn his back on the sanitation workers in Memphis who were striking for a living wage. He said then, in, in words that many of us have forgotten, that it is a crime to have people making starvation wages in an affluent country, and he felt he had to stand with them. Dr. King, as you know, went to, went to Morehouse, an elite black college, uh, he told the sanitation workers in Memphis, our society has to come to the point where the man who has no house is equally important as the man who went to Morehouse. The black elites and the black masses have to get together, and the people of the world have to get together. So he went to Memphis, even though he didn't want to be there, and he had been hounded with death threats for more than a year. Two months earlier than that, he gave a sermon called The Drum Major Instinct in which he looked forward to the day of his own death and he told people what he wanted said at his funeral. April 3rd, when he got on the plane from Atlanta to Memphis, uh, they said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you'll have to get off the plane. As you know, Dr. Martin Luther King is with us uh, flying to Memphis and we've had four separate bomb threats and so we have to examine the plane. And throughout that day, there were security issues, there were hints that something was up. And he was gonna be, he was shot the next day. And so the night that he, his last night on earth, giving his last talk, he says longevity has its place. Like anybody, I'd like to live a long and fruitful life. He says, but I'm not thinking about that now. It's almost as if he knew what was coming. And he said something very strange in the face of that. I don't know what you would say if you thought you were facing your death. And Dr. King said, this is a good time to be alive. He said that's a strange thing to say because the world is all messed up, because there's war, because there's racial injustice, because there's poverty. I know it's hard for you to hear me say that this is a good time to be alive. But we have meaningful work to do. Uh, we have things that can be done at this moment that are important. King said, I wouldn't trade being alive today for being alive at any other time. Now let's think about our own time and the difficulties that we're facing. We've done scholarship for a long time in certain ways. We've studied languages and literatures by their national boundaries. We've studied aesthetic production in art and music, often to create a kind of system of advanced connoisseurship where we decide these works are great and these works are pretty great and these works aren't great at all. We've studied histories often told from the center and not the margins. My own discipline of sociology has a canon of work that purports to be about the entire universe and yet was developed in five specific countries in a 40-year period between 1880 and 1920. We've let many dominant particulars, that is temporary power imbalances, act as if they were universals, as asked if they spoke for everybody and asked as if they spoke about everybody. And I think now, we're seeing the, uh, the cost of that coming due. That there's a crisis of expert knowledge. It certainly exists 
in the studies of the environment and the, and the uh, economy, but I think it exists in the humanities as well. And I think we're starting to see that we've drawn our interlocutors from too narrow a pool, that we, that we need to listen and learn from many more people than the traditional humanities curriculum has enabled us to do. But that doesn't mean we're going to stop doing the humanities. There's a new book by Doris Summer, the great uh, analyst of Latin American literature. It's called The Work of Art in the World. And she talks about drawing on the traditions of the humanities to do a public humanities, um, humanities that exists in universities and in communities, that teaches discernment, that teaches judgment, uh, that enables people to deepen their capacity for democratic decision making. Summer says that art is interruption of habit. That's the most important thing about it. It takes you off guard. Uh, it doesn't allow uh, lazy, familiar patterns of thought to continue. It makes you think and act in a different way. She says, artist citizens also create works of beauty, works of pleasure that make them admirable to each other. And she says that admiration and appreciation are important. We live in a world often of condemnation and contempt. You, you listen to the radio, you watch television, you read comments on websites, and nearly everybody's convinced that everybody else is stupid, debased, degenerate. And of course, I don't want to, uh, I, I would never say there aren't stupid, debased, degenerate people out there. Uh, but I am saying it's a poor mode of, of being because if you expect the worst, you'll never get the best. And if you only look for uh, people's limits, you're not going to be able to appreciate uh, their possibilities. That uh, Summer says that art encourages you to anticipate and contribute. That playing art teaches you to listen, to watch, to hear, to dance, to touch. And that looking at art and the work of artists involves you in a sensory experience where you have to make judgment. She says art triggers fresh perceptions and unclogs procedure. And she says this is especially important in a world that has become inured to suffering and afraid of love. Inured to suffering and afraid of love. So much suffering, so much pain, it becomes a, a spectacle. Um, afraid of love. Uh, King himself used to talk about, we had a very narrow definition of love. We think of it uh, as, uh, as what's on, on Hallmark cards. We think of it as private romance. We think of it as erotic titillation. He says, love is very serious business. The, the Greeks thought love was so serious, they had three separate words for it, agape, philios, and, and eros, and that they felt that you needed to have, have a deaf balance of all different kinds of love, family love, romantic love, uh, patriotic love, uh, erotic love, that all of these had a role to play. And in her simple and direct way, Summer says one of the things the humanities can teach us is love. Now, I want to add to this one thing, and then I want to show you some examples of art that I think is doing this work. And that is, I teach in a department of black studies, and we're organized around three questions that we always have to ask. And that is, how is it that black people survived in America, given the brutalities of slavery, given the cruelties of lynching, given the systematic dehumanization of Jim Crow segregation? How did the miracle of black survival happen? But that isn't all of it. The other part of it is not only how did black people survive, but how do we explain black humanity? How do we explain that the people farthest from decency uh, often produced its most elaborate expressions? The people farthest from democracy turned out to value it the most. How do we explain that people who were uh, taught to hate themselves and to hate each other, found something left to love in each other, even though their oppression often made them unlovable. Some of you may know James Baldwin's great letter to his nephew on his nephew's 14th birthday. Baldwin is in another time of crisis in 1963. He's thinking back uh, 14 years earlier when his nephew was born, and he's thinking back 100 years to the Emancipation Proclamation. And he says, here we are, 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, 14 years after you were born, and the world is still awful. How could we have brought you into this world? How could we encourage you to stay in this world? How can we guide you inside it? 
But he says, your enslaved ancestors who had every reason to give in to despair did not. They found something left to love in themselves and in others. He says, we were trembling then, meaning the family when the nephew was 14, but also enslaved Africans in America for hundreds of years. He says, we were trembling then. We have not stopped trembling yet. But if we had not loved each other, none of us would have survived. Now that love is what propelled Dr. King. That love is what propelled much of the freedom movements of the last century. And that love is not only the private, parochial, and personal property of black people, although it emanated from them, it is also part and parcel of a broader struggle for global justice that involves many different people from many different backgrounds. I think that the work that is being uh, sung and painted and uh, uh, created in material culture in these examples and dozens like them around the country is an important site for the future of the humanities, an important site for us to think about the ways in which our ways of teaching and learning can be expanded by connection to uh, grassroots cultural production, criticism, community making. Nobody likes to change the way they do work. The Swedish anthropologist Ulf Hanners says that often academics do our work by habit. We do what we were trained to do, and then we train other people to do the same thing. He says if you do that, your work will come to resemble Scandinavian cooking, which he described as a practice passed down from generation to generation for no apparent reason. He said you have to, you have to change things every once in a while. Not every tradition is worth keeping. But traditions contain archives of collective memory, repositories, of moral instruction. They're sites of calling communities into being uh, through performance and through practice. They have a great deal to teach us. The people of the world at this moment need to find each other, uh, need to talk to each other, need to accompany each other. We see this in the Occupy movement. We see it in Canada in the I Don't Know More protests. Uh, we see it in the freedom struggles of people all around the world who, even though they may be broke, uh, make it clear that they're not yet broken. In art, uh, in activism, something new is coming around. And we shouldn't bemoan the fact that we have limited resources to deal with or we do this in an age of, of confusion, uh, in an age of contestation, in an age of violence. Subcomandante Marcos of the EZLN uh, often talks about Michelangelo's Statue of David. He says it's one of the great works of art ever created. People know that, but they don't know that what Michelangelo did was even greater because he only had a hollowed out used piece of stone to work on. He didn't have a nice uh, block of stone to start with. He, somebody discarded something, it was hollowed out, but he made something beautiful out of it. And, my, and Marcos says the world we want to transform has already been worked on by history and is largely hollow. We must nevertheless be inventive enough to change it and build a new world. It's still a beautiful time to be alive. Thank you. Um, you mentioned at one point that art is an interruption of habit, and that academia is kind of a habit. So yeah. could you talk a little bit about how art can fit into academia? Yeah. Yeah, and, and we don't want to say all habits or all procedures should be thrown out, in other words, but they should be thought about. We should keep the ones we want to keep. And I think that one of the things that can combine uh, good scholarship and good art is to find the right tool for the right job. And the problem with being too immersed in habit, whether it's in the university or in art, is that you don't get the benefit of disguise, surprise, interruption, and invention. In other words, these, these are, these are categories of the art that we've seen. And I would argue they're very valuable in academic life. And we could point to works that might not be as fun to see on a video, but you know, works that in fact do this, that have a kind of presence of mind. You know, this, this is a phrase I take from Walter Benjamin. He has, a, this, this, uh, he has an essay uh, in a collection called One Way Street called Madame Ariane, Second Door on the Left. And Benjamin is saying, uh, why is it that, that people go to fortune tellers? You know, why do we read the horoscope in the newspaper? Do we really believe a, a tremendously attractive person has a secret crush on us and we don't, we don't know about it? And how many times are these fortunes proven untrue and yet we still come back to them? 
And what Benjamin says is that it's so hard to understand the world. We're looking for clues. We suspect something is going down and we don't already know about it. We suspect our perceptions aren't quite adequate enough. And he says what we want wrongly from the fortune teller is what we should get rightly from scholarship. And that is presence of mind, full understanding of not only what the appearances of things are, but what the imminent and latent potential of them is. And sometimes you can only get that by experimenting. Now this doesn't mean that a random interruption of form is, uh, will, will necessarily be better. And uh, A.J. Hebley and Daniel Fishlin and I just wrote a book called The Fierce Urgency of Now where we're talking about improvisation. And we talked to Richard Muhal Abrams, uh, one of the founders of the uh, Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians in Chicago, who's always identified as somebody who believes in free jazz. And he says, there is no free jazz. First of all, it costs money. But secondly, it's not free and uninhibited. You, you know what you're playing, you know what you're not playing. You can't have improvisation unless it's off some kind of form. And so we're not looking for random mischief by interruption, but we are looking to, uh, to be open to surprise, to be generous about surprise, because we're not, uh, we're not well served by, by telling one story from one point of view. And I think the thing about art is that it shakes up the world in a way and makes some things appear possible that no longer were. But I would argue that good scholarship does that as well. Thank you. You said there were three questions about black studies. Oh, yes. And I didn't. How is it? Uh, yeah. Black survival, black humanity, black democracy. Okay. We argue that these are all miracles. Okay. And black democracy turned out to be not only for blacks because in emancipation, the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, the 1866 Civil Rights Act created new definitions of citizenship and social membership, guaranteed equal protection of the state um, to all people under the jurisdiction of the US. And that has been used by sexual minorities, by immigrants, by religious minorities, by gays and lesbians, by people with disabilities. And so it, 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 was, it was a black, democracy, a black freedom tradition, but it was never only for blacks. The, the, the other miracle maybe we ought to add to is that uh, rather than seeking uh, total uh, inclusion into the US nation state, uh, the other black miracle was that say, if we're gonna be included, the state has to be changed. It has to be made more free, more fair, more, more open. There's a, a incident in uh, one of the biographies of Dr. King in 1965 when the Hart Cellar immigration bill is being debated. And this means that for the first time in U.S. history, uh, the immigration policy will not be expressly racist. And there will be immigration from Asia, there will be immigration from Latin America and from Africa that had previously been prevented by uh, uh, previous immigration law. And the Southern Christian Leadership Conference is talking about this with Dr. King and they say, Doc, if immigrants come from Central and South America, and from Asia, they can take jobs that blacks are just getting into now and we'll lose out if we're, for if we're for this immigration. And King says we can't be for our own freedom and against other people's. We can't be against racist exclusion when it applies to us and then racistly exclude somebody else. And to me, that's another miracle. So I want to go back to the, the art question because I, I thought when you um, talked about art kind of surprising us, that I was going to see some really far out things. And what I saw were really, um, all three, I think, really based on tradition. Mm -hmm. And I, I just found that really interesting because sometimes people say, well, you just have to throw tradition out the door. Yeah. But these were all kind of based on tradition and seeing it in a new way. So there, there's an idea in, in uh, kind of modernism to make it new, to break with the past, that this has been an artistic value, uh, novelty, um, transgression, these are things that have been valued in the Western art, art tradition. And, and when they encounter traditions, it's often to go to other people's traditions. So Picasso building on uh, art in, in Africa or in, in the third world. But, but the idea of what progress within the West has been an almost Oedipal battle in which you break with the world of the parents, you exceed them, you go on and you build something new. Within the traditions of Afro-diasporic peoples and other peoples, I think the majority of the people around the world, the ancestors are still here. 
being in the world of the ancestors is also a form of power. Uh, in, uh, in, in, in the slave community, they used to turn things upside down because inversion was power. Inversion was where the ancestors were. Inversion put your head close to the ground. The ancestors were in the ground. That gave you a certain kind of power. And so the idea was not so much to break with the ancestors, but also to draw on their power, but adapt it to something new. In other words, the, 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 the past never goes away, but the past is never secure enough for the present. And so the whole tradition is one in which you not make something totally radically new, but you improvise on, on the past. So you think of what, what the jazz solo is. You know, the jazz solo can take a kind of Tin Pan Alley pop tune and turn it inside out. And so uh, in, in ragtime, uh, uh, under, the bamboo, uh, uh, under the bamboo tree can be turned inside out, and you, you play the counterpoint instead of the melody. It's all working with efficacious materials to give them a new value. This, this is what uh, root, root healers do. This is what, uh, what voodoo is, is built around, and it's the idea not so much of accessing something new, but finding hidden value in what is. I, I always use the examples of Lester Young and Billie Holiday, uh, neither of whom had tremendous power on their instruments. And so they had to make you listen by playing soft things that were familiar to you, but then were slightly unfamiliar. In, 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 I saw an interview with Miles Davis once, and they say, you know, you, you, you play all these daring solos. He says, how do you do that? He says, I always listen for what I can leave out. So you're building on the past, but you're making it different. Yes? I wanted you to, I was wondering if you would comment on some public commentators uh, who focus on our use of theory and jargon and explain that that's why they ignore the humanities. We're not talking in a language that's penetrable to the average person. Could you comment on that? Yeah, well, you know, physics isn't talking in a language that's penetrable <laughs> to the average person. They seem to be doing fine. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very much for, I think there's a politics in the language we use, and I'm very much for um, a democratic pedagogy. On the other hand, I think there's a time and a place, you know, that, that you want the right tool for the right job. I never feel that we know so much that we can afford to give up on any way of knowing. And so when I read uh, advanced uh, theoretical work, you know, the, 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 the enormous benefit that post-structuralism brought to literary criticism and to, to criticism in, in all the humanities, uh, it took us away from a, a, a kind of naivety about language. It, it took us away from thinking uh, uh, too much about the autonomy of the text. And it also talked about how vexed social relations are because the powers we fight against aren't just out there, but they're in here. I mean, to me, the language of theory comes about because of the defeats of the freedom movements of the mid uh, 20th century, especially in France, and then an effort to figure out why is domination so deeply inside us rather than being out there. And I think that, that, that the theoretical works are tremendously important. What I will say is that every tool that enables also inhibits. And so the tools that I'm showing to you enable a democratic conversation that wouldn't be had before. But they might inhibit us from stepping back from thinking uh, people in project row houses uh, are oppressed in our society. And mobilizing for inclusion in this society matters a lot to them. But that actually may not be a very much help to indigenous people in the Amazon uh, who would suffer uh, from uh, increased wealth in Houston, Texas. You know, in other words, we might not be asking enough questions about it. I think with the brands of theory that, that you're talking about, the danger is, is that the desire for criticism is so thorough, it can produce a kind of paralysis where, where, we, where we fear um, using a word like emancipation because it's been used so badly and so, uh, so falsely. It's made us uh, desire a kind of freedom that isn't freedom at all. It's absolutely important to have that critique, but to give up the word or to give up the goal, you know, because it's, it's in one historical moment, it's embedded in a structure of power, seems to me to betray post-structuralism's real insight, and that is there is no pure form uh, of, of, of power or no totally impure form of power. We can't possibly struggle against the Enlightenment without using Enlightenment tools. We can't struggle against uh, the liberal subject of law, the, the, uh, the, the religious uh, subject of religion, the psychoanalytic subject of psychoanalysis, without also using those terms. That, that's how we become legible to ourselves. And so it goes back to ha not 
are they there or not, but are we repositioning? Them? Are, are we using what the situation is called detour and mont? Are, are we finding new possibilities in them? Okay, well, you know, the, the, the most uh, grievous offense you could do as a scholar is keep a room full of people from a reception where there's food and drink. And so uh, it's time to unite the many to eat the food. Thank you very much for your attention.